So, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this WWEA webinar, which is one of the first webinars in this year 2021. The theme of this webinar is Digitalization Energy Markets of Tomorrow, and I'm very pleased that we have uh, great speakers here who will present uh, in the exciting new technologies which play an increasing role on the wind power, on the renewable energy or re renewable power markets. Before we start, let me explain a little bit uh, the, uh, the, the background of these uh, webinars. First, uh, this is a public event, so the event is uh, not only broadcasted now in the Zoom meeting, but also it's broadcasted in a live stream on YouTube and on uh, various social media. So whenever you speak, uh, whenever you raise your voice, please be aware that this might be visible by others as well. Um, please um, also stay muted until you are requested to speak. Of course, that also is uh, for the speakers. If you have any questions for the speakers, we request you to write your uh, question in the chat, you have a chat window here where you can type your uh, question and then please address the person you want to answer your uh, uh, question. Yeah, with this, um, let me say um, welcome to everyone. Um, a special uh, greetings and thank you also to the partner of our webinar, Profic Ventus, which allows us to hold these webinars for free. And now I would like hand, to hand over to the president of the World Wind Energy Association, who is based in Australia. Peter, if I may ask you to welcome our participants. Certainly, uh, I trust that uh, I can be heard. Could you confirm that? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you very much, uh, because uh, it's not showing on my screen. But a, a warm welcome to everybody participating and as Stefan has just said, this uh, uh, early uh, 2021 uh, webinar, we've been having quite a large number of webinars over the past year. And uh, I think the addition of this type of activity has been something which has been welcomed by a wide cross section of people involved with the World Wind Energy Association and uh, the World Wind Energy scene. And this uh, topic for tonight is something which, or today, tonight for me, uh, is something which uh, I think is going to be extremely interesting as the world rolls over to uh, the use of renewables, there'll be questions in relation to grids, there'll be questions in relation to pricing, there'll be questions in relation to markets and how people can balance uh, the various factors I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, webinar and I'm looking forward to hearing the contributions and then perhaps we can sum up at the end. So welcome everybody. Thank you, Stefan, for organizing this and back to you. Thank you very much, Peter and uh, greetings to Australia. And now I have the pleasure to invite our first speaker, uh, Mr. Guang Chung Pan. I've also heard that your English name is Alan. So Alan, welcome, you are the gold Goldwind Chief Transformation Officer. Goldwind is, of course, known as the largest Chinese wind turbine manufacturer, also one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers um, of the world. Um, of course, we are also uh, aware that the Chinese wind energy market is now really very, very big. You had a very successful year, um, 2020. And now we're looking forward to hearing from what you're doing beyond uh, producing manufacturing wind turbines. You will speak about gold wind electricity trading practice support supported by digital technologies. So um, Ellen, if I may request you to start your presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's not so clear if you speak a bit. Uh, can you yeah, hear me yeah. now? Yes. Very okay. Good. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, so you will, you will let me to share my window, right? Uh, 
Okay, just a minute. Now, can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yes, looks very good. Please go All ahead. Right. That's great. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. That uh, our topic today is our digitalization in electricity market trading. As you all know, that China has just started this uh, electricity market uh, reform in about a, a five years ago. So we would start from there. So to uh, Two topics. One is China electricity market. We we'll have a very short brief view, and then we will uh, go into digitalization in gold wins practice. Uh, it comes a long way for China to really come to this uh, electricity reform. Um, in the past decades, we have a long time of reform for electricity market. The key activities would involve to uh, like the separation of government and end price and separation of grid and plants, the grid and the power plants and separation of main business and uh, uh, supportary business. But those two, those are the time until 2014. In 2015 until now, uh, we come to the second round reform. It's like a Western world before was more like a regulated market. And we, the whole nation would plan to have this reform to build up a competitive market. So we would uh, have a lot of uh, 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 provinces would open this electricity market and in Basically, in the first couple of years, we're in trail, in trail, and now we come to uh, the uh, sport market. Before it was uh, mid and long term market. So that's now is we are still in the initial phase of this electricity market. So as for gold wind, we are participated in this reform. We are an active uh, participate participant of this reform activities. The structure in China is basically it's very similar to uh, other countries. You will see a whole wholesale market and retail market. In wholesale market, the seller would be the power, power, uh, power plant and the generators. And this, the buyer would be the retail, retailer companies and they will sell through retail market to retail customers. In wholesale, Market, we have energy market that covers mid and long term and spoiler market. Uh, this is the area that uh, we have uh, some trials in provinces, but for capacity, we have not started yet. In retail, we basically have set a menu uh, and uh, example like a fixed price and TOU price. Uh, in future, if we have capacity, we would have a rental. Uh, energy management contracts. A very brief uh, uh, introduction about uh, what the status uh, in the current days. Like uh, we have uh, since when, uh, 2015 until now, we have 32 independent provincial wholesale markets. Basically, is about a mid and long term uh, market. Last year we have, uh, last year we have a sport market. Among those 32, uh, we have eight provinces to trail uh, sport market. Three of those eight, uh, we have a renewable energy available. Uh, for other five, because the, you know, the, uh, the sport market is still in the initial phase. So, the other five is not uh, ready yet for renewable energy. In total, we have um, about uh, over 10,000 retailers in China. 70% uh, of midterm and 30% sport. 
So this is the overview of uh, China electricity market and reform. Uh, now I would like to talk about a little bit about our digitalization in our uh, uh, energy market trading. As you know that uh, gold wind is uh, a generator, basically. Uh, we build up, uh, we manufacture turbines and also we build up or uh, uh, wind farms as the investor and the operator. So we have we have uh, about about a ten years ISS operation operations for both our wind farms and also our third party wind farms. Besides those, with this China electricity market, we have. Uh, participate both wholesale market and retail market in generation side as a supply aggregator and retail side as a load aggregator. Uh, some numbers I would share with you, like in generation side, uh, we have annual sale about uh, 10 billion kilowatt hours. Uh, we have managed 40 plus renewable plants. We have registered in 14 provincial markets, and uh, three of them uh, renewable or renewable spot market. All, all uh, uh, 14 markets, we have uh, short, medium and long-term uh, markets. In retail side, we have annual contract about 10 billion ki uh, kilowatt hours, about 2,000 customers, and also 14 provincial market, and uh, three, three of them are uh, renewable energy for market. So this is the overall our uh, our trading, and I would introduce uh, the generation side and retail side because generation and the retail uh, they are counterpart. So I would have put more time on the retail. Talking about the generation side, and um, as we we think of we Goldwind is a supply aggregator and uh, we have managed uh, wind farm we have managed solar plants we have installed some uh, batteries into some uh, wind farms we agreed in this province we manage uh, we do business we aggregate or uh, power curve all the outputs uh, into one centralized managed location and with the flexibility resources. And then we make offer to the energy market. And energy market is, is much they will have clearing and settlement and data back to go to wind. Uh, two, uh, basically two things I would mention here that because we have uh, uh, just initially practiced this uh, market trading. So we are still in the learning pro learning process. Uh, we have found a focus on price and load is not is very challenging for us. For example, in the past we found out our in the, in the uh, price uh, forecast, the accuracy is about a sixty to eighty percent. But we found out a way with AI aided. We call it a price aggregated quantitative model. We make a our price forecast accuracy up to uh, ninety two percent. For the output uh, uh, focus in submission before we menu submit it to uh, to the transaction center, uh, there are quite many errors and uh, penalty. And with this uh, software application, we have uh, make our real time spot market out of the submission. And this is the first kind, uh, first of kind of software application in this uh, output um, uh, submission, uh, make a big improvement. For example, uh, not only improve the efficiency by 80%, but also improve uh, rise the price by 
okay, for the retail side, we think Goldwind Retail also the uh, load aggregator. The process is very similar to the uh, generation side. Uh, we aggregate all the loads and flexibility and um, make it a loader curve and have the flexibility resource uh, in sum. We make a calculation, we make our strategy uh, decision operation. Um, so we come at the best offer uh, to the market. And uh, uh, probably I needed to introduce, we have um, every 15 minutes we have, every, we have a day ahead market and a real time market. And um, for each forecast we needed to, um, for, for a day, 24 hours, we needed to submit 96 points, which means that every 15 minutes we need a forecast point. So in this process, uh, when we talk about technology platform, this is our platform. It is, is used, has been used by both um, uh, retail side and uh, generation side, uh, because this is a showcase for us how we use our technology to support our uh, trading. So I will just talk about a tech, a retail technology platform to introduce how we do this business with this uh, uh, digitalization support. In the bottom, we have a hardware. For example, we have distributed generation meters and controls. We have generation meters controls. We have storage units and controls. We have uh, uh, retail meters and some other units. Uh, this is really the hardware part of this app, uh, this platform. Above that, we, we collect all the data into the database. For example, the load, uh, the price, uh, the market price and volume, the grid, uh, the weather generation. And to the model part, we have wholesale price forecast, we have um, load product, load forecast, we have generation forecast. To the application level, the key part is uh, trading. For example, uh, we have load and price forecast application. We have, based upon those load and price forecast, we have a strategy optimization to make a decision, the best offer to offer to the, uh, to the market. Along with the trading, we have uh, retailing. Uh, mainly retailing part is about a customer relationship management and uh, settlement. For dispatching, we will dispatch our demand response uh, facilities uh, in, in both sides. Uh, could just about a, a couple of cases for us to show how we um, uh, run this platform. Load forecast and price forecast and the strategy optimization are the three key parts of this platform. It's the most critical part. Uh, for example, in Jiangsu province, uh, we made a load of focus for our customers. The purpose is the, fo the, the better the focus, the less of the penalty and the better arbitrage opportunity for, for, uh, for from the market. So as it, you would see that our focus accuracy is pretty high. It's about a 99% plus. In load, uh, in the price simulation part, which is the Price of forecast. Uh, we focus a day ahead. We focus uh, uh, real time, and uh, both day ahead and real time is in 96 points for a day. At this moment, that day ahead, we submit one time for the uh, 96 points for the real time market. Every 15 minutes, we needed to support the. Uh, uh, we needed to submit the price and output uh, offer. Our, our focus, we still train the model uh, in that the training is just because we like have the historical data from the market. So our model is still in the process of development. 
And as the retailer, we needed to uh, sell, sell a reasonable uh, price to our customers. And uh, we use a model uh, value at risk uh, to evaluate the evaluate different customers' uh, uses and the pattern. For some customers, we would charge less for the risk because the, their focus is very accurate and uh, stable of the uh, consumption. For some customers, for example, this is in Shanxi province, uh, on the right side, those two customers, they have, uh, we would say they have a very inaccurate, inaccurate focus of uh, usage. So uh, we would charge them more uh, for, the, for the price than other uh, customers. Uh, this chart shows the whole uh, customers in Shanxi province. Uh, as a sum of our technology, uh, this is a chart that we plan to uh, to build up or to improve uh, in our you know uh, technology pl uh, platform uh, because we now we have uh, quite many uh, retailers even generators and how we win the market among so many competition we plan to build up uh, we plan to develop our retailer part as a technology-based business instead of relation-based. And uh, as you would see, we plan to uh, develop a CRM system uh, to make better improvement on load focus, price focus, and uh, decision strategy optimization and risk evaluation and also in the last uh, trading operations and management. All these areas we needed to make a, a focused improvement for our uh, business, because with those capability, we can win in the market. That's all uh, my introduction uh, for, uh, for my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very interesting, showing how you do this. Uh, do we have questions here for Alan? I, I, just just uh, from my side, a brief question. Are you doing this only for your own wind turbines that you own and operate? Or are you doing this for other parties as well? For I mean, who, who are the clients? Are these investors, wind farm operators? Uh, yes, we do. And um, we not only run business for our own uh, wind farms, but also we have some partnership with the third party, with, with other wind farm companies, because they want us to run for them uh, as the wind farm operators, because they may lack of uh, business and management capability for wind farms. So those wind farms we can also run. It's about a one, uh, I think it's one fifth of uh, access operations is, is, is from other companies. And then what's the, like in, in megawatt, how many megawatt are you controlling and doing that forecasting? In total, about uh, five gigawatts in total. Okay. Very good. So do we have any other questions? If that's not the case, then I would say, uh, thank you so much again and uh, Best regards to Beijing. And then I would uh, um, go to Italy and welcome um, our two speakers from Italy. It's uh, from the company Nuo Energy, which belongs, I understand, to Falk Renewables. And I'm pleased to have here Valeria Scarcetta, who is the managing director, and Andrea Ronchi, who is the marketing and sales director. And uh, you will uh, talk about data science and artificial intelligence to enable the future of asset management. So we look forward to hearing from you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. So let me try to share my screen. Okay, so good morning uh, again uh, and, and thank you 
um, uh, to World Wind Energy Association for the invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, as Stefan said, I'm Andrea Ronchi and I'm the Strategic Development Director of NUO. And today uh, we will talk about uh, uh, numbers, uh, we will talk about mathematics, data science and artificial intelligence. But most of all, we will talk about uh, sustainability and uh, responsibility. Uh, because today the humankind has uh, easy access to tools for a better comprehension and interpretation of the reality. And from these capabilities derive also a, a, a huge responsibility. Uh, but what we want to stress is that this is not only about the responsibility of the individuals. Uh, we think that this is also about the responsibility of uh, our renewable energy industry as a whole. Because in this uh, epic challenge of the humankind towards the net zero targets, uh, renewable energy industry, we know that is going to play a key role, uh, but the paradigm must uh, change to make this sector economically and uh, let's say, yes, economically sustainable in a world that is in, in great evolution. Okay, so to, to enter uh, in the core of uh, our, um, our keynote, uh, I would like to leave the floor for uh, a moment to Valeria Scargetta, which is uh, our managing director that in 2020 made possible to create and launch uh, on the market our data science solutions. So Valeria, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, good morning and hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being here, for having uh, this space to talk to you, and I'm really happy to be here, uh, also because this happens just more or less one year after the incorporation of NUO. And uh, in this year, we made possible to bring to reality a vision uh, and also a great uh, uh, experiment of corporate entrepreneurship. NU Indeed is a corporate startup and it is the startup of Spike Renewables Group. Uh, and uh, as we like to say, we are a startup with a great heritage because we incorporate the experience of a major ITC, which is the Falch Group, the know-how of a leading asset management company, which is Vector Renewables, and a global presence. But at the same time, we have the dynamism of a digital startup. And this cocktail allowed us to create in less than one year a set of digital tools which are already used and in place for more than three gigawatts of both solar and wind farms worldwide. How we see ourselves? We see ourselves as a hub, a hub that is grouping and linking together heterogeneous competencies and expertise in the fields of data science, software development, renewable asset management, and indeed, our team of 27 professionals coming from all these different uh, areas of expertise are a good example of this multidisciplinary approach. But what we want to be is also a bridge. We want to bridge our customers, which are the asset owners, uh, with the community of innovators that decided to dedicate their talent, their creativity, their know-how to the innovation in the world of renewable energy. And in fact, in this year, besides creating the powerful tools uh, which have been developed internally, we also have always been keeping an eye on the market, uh, spidering the market for the best inno innovations. And uh, we connect this innovation, we bridge this innovation to, uh, the, to the final users, which are the asset owners, uh, in what we call uh, the universe of API ecosystem, which is a network, a network of uh, relationship with the third parties that make up the world of data science. So uh, digital boutiques, uh, university spin-offs, uh, other startups. And uh, and we bring all that to the asset owners, which mostly comes from a financial world. We think that the challenge, this challenge that humanity is facing uh, in these times has deadlines. And so we cannot waste uh, our time and we cannot think that we can use all schemes uh, uh, for the future. So we think that partnering is the real key uh, for the success of a business model of our business model. 
And so uh, I leave the ground uh, again to Andrea to get a little bit more in depth and give a contextualization of all these, uh, all these work. Yes, thank you, Valeria. So as we said uh, at the beginning of uh, the keynote and also in uh, Valeria, uh, speech, the renewable energy industry is uh, changing uh, the traditional business model. You know, uh, market parity, um, hybrid plants uh, with the storage or uh, hydrogen production, uh, participation to the balancing markets, uh, participation to even more and more dynamic markets, uh, you know, for um, uh, the requirement of uh, the dispatching activity, just to mention some of the new ingredients are definitely making the renewable energy business model uh, more and more complex. Uh, now, the approach must be uh, much more industrial rather than uh, financial like it used to be uh, in the past because from one side, uh, asset owner and asset managers must streamline the productivity of the plants. And from another side, more targets means uh, more variable to control more variable to control means more data, and all this is generating a higher complexity, okay? So at the same time, asset owners are aiming to expand the size of their portfolio, and they wanna do it by decoupling the size of the portfolio from the cost of the asset management activities. So before going ahead, I take the opportunity um, uh, to bring you to a very short journey to uh, what we define with the tag data industry, okay? And uh, the aim is not um, to, to make a, a training on data science, but it's uh, a way to set some common definition and to bring a bit of clarity in a context where, um, let's say, the, the, the one of the, the major... Uh, one of the major issues is what I call uh, the, the, the clash of the buzzwords, okay? So in a in few years, uh, you might have uh, noticed that a lot of new words started to take a major role in almost uh, any kind of business discussion. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, analytics, IoT, cloud, etc. Uh, the issue is that those definitions and the border of each of those um, single words is often confused uh, even by the people who is uh, theorizing that field. So to try to make the things a bit clearer, I would like to propose to you um, my personal mind map, okay? So let's say that everything starts with uh, an asset uh, or a process under our control. It could be a, a power plant, um, an o &M activity, whatever and uh, an external environment we must interact with, okay? Um, weather condition, market prices, etc. Both of them are generating data. Then uh, we have something or somebody that collect those data um, through some kind of connectivity and transfer those data uh, or make accessible to somebody else uh, the data set, okay? We then have the opportunity to use uh, mathematics to organize, read, interpret, and uh, elaborate those data, those informations. And then once we find the right way, or at least a functional way to do something with those information, those data um, are the ones that we can uh, um, elaborate through software development technique to automize uh, that process of elaboration and to make accessible for the final user um, the outcome of the elaboration of those data, okay? Uh, the individual finally will have the opportunity to take a better decision and to be more efficient. Uh, that's it. Uh, this is the basic workflow and these are the common denominator of all the activity that uh, are behind the fancy words we have seen uh, uh, in the previous slide. So now let's uh, try in another minute to collocate uh, some of those uh, uh, keyword or, or, or buzzword <laughs> in, the right, in the right place. So we have uh, IoT, SCADA, 5G, satellite connection, et cetera, that are the beginning of the value chain as they are technology that collect and transfers information, okay? Then we have uh, uh, classical statistics, for instance, uh, linear regressions, 
uh, or the super popular artificial intelligence develop developments with um, all its uh, sub definition like machine learning, which is again a definition to group different modeling technique like neural network, random forest, etc. etc. Uh, here, especially the major companies are getting super exciting in quoting things that most of the time they don't even understand completely. But the truth is that uh, uh, mathematics um, uh, is what stands behind. Okay, so uh, this is at the end of the journey algebra that existed since a very long time ago. But the first, for the first time, humanity can count on such a powerful computational power that finally that mathematic is becoming uh, uh, somehow very, very, very useful. Okay, so how can uh, use this mathematic? Of course, through software, as we said, possibly well designed. And this is uh, um, a very complicated part of uh, this uh, value chain, as software development requires back end codes, okay which is the part where software needs to acquire data, prepare and clean the data set and automate um, all, all the flows. Then a core, which is where we transform the mathematic um, into code effectively. Okay. And finally, a front end, which is made of several things uh, such as uh, user interfaces. Okay. Uh, this is what we should use the word platform form. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, data visualization techniques like dashboard, the KPI, etc. So in Nuo, uh, we, we, we cover what you see here in, um, uh, in green. Um, uh, that, that's, uh, um, that, that's where we, we focus our energy and where we want to bring uh, to the audience a bit of uh, case history about our experience. We, we deal with mathematics and software development, okay? So, um, how we interpret this uh, value chain uh, in Nuo? Uh, we, we, um, uh, we, we, we think that data science can help asset owners and asset managers uh, essentially in four ways, okay? Uh, the first one is by increasing the descriptive capabilities to better monitor and understand uh, what happened. Okay. The second way is by generating predictions uh, to understand what is going to happen. We have seen something also in the previous presentation by, by the, the colleagues of uh, Goldwind. And uh, also by suggesting prescription, which, which means recommending which action to take. And last but not least, uh, another powerful uh, um, set of tools uh, in the fields of uh, data science and software development uh, is about uh, the automation of, of non-discretionary processes, okay? Um, in Nuo, we interpreted this uh, by creating three types of solution, okay? We deployed uh, as uh, our very first deployments of uh, 2020 an uh, asset management software as a service platform. But then we have also a vertical which is working for producing advanced artificial intelligence model that can be somehow transferred from one, from one plant to another plant or from one asset owner to another asset owner. Okay, of course, with the normal um, uh, ad hoc deployment. But another very important vertical, and I think is useful also for this uh, conversation of today, is based on the custom data science project. Because when we enter into the predictive and prescriptive approach, and we want to foster a numeric approach, like an, an approach based on AI, by having a different kind of inputs, even though the semantic area is similar, because we're still talking about the generation of renewable energy, we must adapt and change the models as well. Okay, so the one size fits all uh, paradigm uh, used in the, let's say, classical um, software era with this kind of AI developments uh, is not often the case. So we know, we are aware of um, how important is uh, the custom approach. And this is also something to take into consideration when, for instance, we designed our business model because you can um, <laughs> replicate and you can industrialize the approach, but up to a certain level, okay? 
Um, just to give you um, a few um, highlights of what we did, okay? Here um, you have a, a very brief snapshot, um, let's say an influence of the look and feel of our platform, okay? Um, uh, and this is, uh, um, uh, I mean, a, a, a platform which has a different module from the performance analysis, which is the one we use to help our customer to visualize the status of the plants and to evaluate all the main technical KPI. Okay, and moreover, it also manages the alarms, the events generated by the plant and by the users. And this is in the sphere of technical asset management. Then, of course, uh, descriptive analytics are very helpful also for the financial asset management or commercial asset management activities, okay? For instance, we have a specific model uh, that it's uh, used for the creation of the balance sheet, the profit and loss, make uh, advanced variance analysis to understand and comprehend why, uh, uh, why there has been a difference between the budget and the actual values, okay? To understand the reason why um, you have uh, deltas between uh, these uh, two values. And then, of course, other modules uh, related to the energy management, where, is, uh, where the prices and the market uh, fluctuation are entering into scenes, uh, as well as uh, weather prediction for the prediction of the, the, the production. Then a site management section and uh, another, let's say, useful, uh, powerful documental system. But it's uh, not the aim of the presentation. I mean, we don't want, we don't want to present here our um, uh, tools. We want to present you our approach, okay? And I think um, uh, by explaining you how we interpreted the, the, uh, the, the, the world related to the advanced AI model, we can add some elements for the discussion of uh, today, um, today webinar. Uh, thanks to our data science team that we uh, developed internally, uh, we create and deliver the output of proprietary and predictive and prescriptive models, okay? So the team worked a lot in the creation of powerful AI models for the prediction of anomalies, for instance, the, uh, the ma let's say the major cluster of predictive maintenance tasks. There are a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, um, minor targets which are composing the macrosphere of predictive, uh, um, uh, predictive uh, analysis. Uh, and I want to uh, take a minute to show you uh, an example, okay? Um, uh, so, you know, the models are running in the background, so the complexity us usually is uh, hidden. <laughs> from the eye of the final user, but uh, I wanted to give you a representation of what happens uh, behind the scene with one of the, the models we deployed for the uh, prediction of anomalies in the wind, um, uh, in the wind, uh, uh, in the wind context, okay, in the wind generation, in the eolic generation context, okay. Um, uh, let's look for a moment uh, at this graph, uh, which is representing uh, the output of uh, this uh, anomaly uh, prediction algorithm for the generator temperature, okay, of, uh, of a wind plant. In blue, you can see the predicted temperature of the generator. In gray, and um, thank God you, you don't see too much gray in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, chart. You see the observed temperature of the generator. Okay, so um, when you see the gray line, uh, it means that our prediction was a bit different from the observed. Okay, but in orange we highlight the moments when the forecast is differing from the observed uh, data for more than three hours. Okay, and in red. Um, you have an highlight of when the differences between the observed and the uh, predicted values are differing for more than 12 consecutive hours, okay? Uh, with this model, we have the opportunity to predict the overheating uh, of a generator up to 24 days in advance with sporadic alarms, okay? And 10 hours earlier with a super high reliability which is very useful for, um, you know, making uh, in the short term um, decision for the management <coughs> of the asset in order to avoid outages or 
um, complication that can determine um, uh, a lot of costs uh, for, for, for the management of the, the facility. Okay. But as I said, we think uh, that just a few amount of uh, um, models can be uh, de de developed for one site and then transferred uh, automatically from uh, another one. Okay. We think that if you want really high performance, especially when uh, trying to model um, physical uh, processes, uh, customization, it's uh, um, often required, okay? In the example that uh, before our colleagues from Goldwyn presented, uh, for instance, there is a case where um, uh, the, the, the standardization is a bit more uh, possible because you have, uh, according to the markets where you are uh, um, applying the data, having homogeneous inputs, okay? And also the outputs that are used by the dispatching desk are homogeneous as well. So it's, it's uh, doable to create something that you can uh, um, you know, scale. But when you want to model a physical process, then uh, there is uh, um, uh, an element which is to take into consideration. And just to conclude, um, uh, one of the reasons why customization is still needed in the renewable energy industry is because at the end of the day, there is a very big lack of standards. <laughs> so the, 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 the call we, we want to, to, to make uh, also in uh, WWEA context uh, is to stimulate uh, um, uh, producers, vendors, and ONM to define some kind of standards for uh, the data infrastructure of the site that they build and they manage. Because uh, this uh, data fragmentation is requiring uh, to put a lot of effort in uh, the harmonization of those data sets. And I think the energies of uh, companies like our uh, or uh, all the other players that are developing in, in data science approach for renewable should be dedicated more to the, uh, let's say, to the final stage of the deployment, which is not the data preparation and data alignment. So to, to, to conclude with a sentence, we think that data probably are not the oil of the future, like many <laughs> used to say, but we uh, want to stress the fact that probably they will be the oil platform of the future. And this future is for sure led by the renewable energy industry, guys. So I leave the floor to you, Stefan. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very interesting. And of course, we liked having you speaking about not only the market itself, but a lot that is around it, where we can also see potential synergies between uh, some of what our other colleagues here are speaking about, will speak about, and what you're doing. Uh, very interesting, especially also your remark that there would be a need for standardization in this field that we should certainly come back to that. Now, let me have a look whether there are questions uh, from anyone. Um, if that is not the case, then uh, again, certainly let's not forget about your proposal, but let's uh, continue now with our next speaker. And uh, now thank you to Italy. You, you are based in Milan? Uh, yes, we are based uh, in Milan and Madrid. Yeah. So Italy and Spain. <laughs> So I don't know, I was muted for a second here. Very good. Well then, um, greetings to southern part of Europe. And uh, now, seen from where I am now, not so far away, I think it's like 30 kilometers. Welcome to Jan Angenfort from company Next Kraftwerke, okay? uh, which is a company which uh, is managing a virtual, or I don't know whether you say one virtual power plant, um, you're dealing with virtual power plant technology. Jan, I'm very happy to welcome you here. I'd like to hand over directly to you to um, introduce uh, your technology and uh, explain what you're doing. Thanks for having me and thanks for the opportunity to, to basically answer the first question. Is it one virtual power plant or many? <laughs> and this, uh, this depends a little bit on, <clears throat> on, your, on your point of view. Um, and um, I would like to start with um, just shortly showing what a virtual power plant is and why there is a need for it. 
and then I'll be, of course, very open to questions. Um, so virtual power plant, and this is where the name comes from, is basically the idea to aggregate uh, hundreds, thousands, hundred thousands of um, also wind power, of course, um, in one central um, uh, control system um, and thus mimic basically the role from the market perspective that conventional power plants used to have. So what we do is we um, uh, see ourselves as the, if you like, platform in the middle um, between the independent distributed power producers on the one side, um, then the oftentimes, at least in Europe, liberalized uh, power markets, the grid operators that are also um, uh, their own entity in most or in many countries, at least in Europe and in, in Germany, certainly. And um, then again, the, in the best case, flexible power consumers, but also from regular power consumers. So what we basically do is matchmaking, if you like. Um, so we forecast um, the renewable energy production from each and every network unit um, where we have a live data access to um, so that we know what amount of power is going to come um, into the grid from each unit individually, but then of course aggregated into the whole pool as, as we call it, into the whole fleet. Um, and then we trade that power on um, short-term short spot markets um, in, the, in Europe. Um, and last thing, um, in, if, if uh, there is a, <clears throat> if there is um, turbulence, let's say in the grid, the grid operators can sense or will send signals to our central control system, which we then split up um, in a couple of, of seconds um, to thousands of network units, not wind energy in this case, <laughs> uh, and ramp them up or down to, um, yeah, to balance the grid. Um, and by doing so, uh, we have basically, um, to a large extent at least, mimicked the role of a conventional power plant. We have the generation, not our generation. We don't have any generation. We don't own any assets. We don't operate any assets. Um, but we provide, if you like, um, the, um, the forecasting for the generation, the trading, the billing um, of the generation, and also the, the dispatch, which is... Um, in a way, uh, uh, at least uh, as important as the generation itself. So to basically time the, um, the, the generation um, towards those time points where the grid is really needing um, more or less uh, electricity. Today, we have networked um, even now more than 10,000 assets um, with slightly less uh, uh, under 10 thousand megawatt in capacity. We are operating in a couple of um, European countries, mostly Germany's neighboring countries. Um, but uh, let's say for the sake of time, uh, let me get uh, uh, through this pretty quickly. We also use this technology platform uh, that we have assembled to network and to dispatch all those assets to third parties. So uh, your question, Stefan, uh, is there one virtual power plant or many? Depends on your viewpoint. We see it as our own virtual power plant is one. So we, we, uh, we operate one, one virtual power plant for Europe or Central Europe, Central Western Europe. Um, but we have also um, provided our technology to third parties in the UK, for example, in Japan, so that new virtual power plants will um, come into reality in those countries as well. Perhaps a little bit of a more closer look at what we do, um, ex especially in terms of digitization. Um, if you have those 10,000 assets, or if you, when we had those 10,000 assets in Germany before the technology of virtual power plants came into, into existence, um, what we had was this, you can't even call it strategy, but this fact that uh, the produce and forget uh, mode was uh, high up and running, so everyone um, was just produce from the renewable side at least was producing, and then there was a cut, and then the the grid operator had to take care of the infeed, um, not only physically but also in terms of uh, of financial settlement of balancing etc. And um, with the introduction of of a virtual power plant, we now have live knowledge of what is happening at each plant, and so we have more lead time to um, dispatch or to trade, but also to dispatch each individual unit. Um, and this algorithm, algorithm that then automatically dispatches those assets gets, um, gets its, its uh, information from various uh, uh, data sources, uh, you could say, 
Um, so, of course, we have the live data from each asset. We have weather forecasts, our own weather forecasts, public weather forecasts, um, weather forecasts that we buy from, from third party operators. Um, we have uh, the control reserve set points, what I just said from the TSO. So, they feed in, okay, virtual power plant. Now we need 10 megawatts more in the next couple of seconds. We have power exchange price forecasting, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, we have all kinds of different data sets that get uh, meshed basically um, into one optimized schedule that, that then will be sent back to each and every individual unit. And this way we can um, basically say goodbye to this uh, produce and forget uh, mode and this, this, this barrier that used to be between the individual operator and the market and the grid operator. Um, uh, I already uh, mentioned that. So one product that we have is grid stabilizing flexibility. So we use um, this fleet of network units to um, balance the grid um, according to not only the needs of the TSO, of the transmission system operator, but also, and then it gets complicated, um, uh, taking into account the restrictions that each and every individual, individual unit has. Um, and... Um, so if we get a call or an activation of, let's say, 20, 25 megawatts, for example, upwards flexibility, so to ramp up um, from the TSO, we then split up this signal into um, a couple of hundred, actually, um, sometimes a couple of hundred um, individual signals that then will be transferred automatically to uh, the individual side. And our signal then dispatches or ramps, in this case, ramps the unit up. Or if it's a consumer, ramps it down. <laughs> it has the same effect, of course. Um, we have amassed uh, more than 1,500 megawatts of high class, let's say, flexibility, mostly coming from uh, bioenergy, um, a little bit hydro, um, a little bit electrolyzers on the demand side. We have the first projects, not only pilot projects, but actual projects um, with uh, uh, electric vehicles in, in the Netherlands. Um, and this is this, this kind of um, very colorful um, fleet of different technologies that we have put together, um, which is, we are very technology neutral, you could say. So as long as it is, it is uh, clean tech and, uh, and flexible, um, uh, there, is, there is something that we can do with it, basically. Wind is something uh, that is not used today for this product, for control reserve delivery. Um, there are technical reasons, but there are also economic reasons. Technical reason number one is, of course, you cannot provide upwards flexibility that easily with wind because you cannot produce more wind if there is not more wind. Um, uh, you could, but, but you could definitely provide downward flexibility, but even then the TSOs need a, what they call um, a control set point at which uh, point basically the turbine, uh, at which capacity the turbine is running to then be able to trust that it will be able to um, uh, go down from that exact um, and 100% sure um, in feed. Um, then, and this is technically feasible. There have been other parties, not us, but other parties that have shown that uh, it is possible to deliver control reserve through that method, but then it is not economical, but uh, because who would turn down the wind turbine to um, a 100% um, uh, secure basically supply over the next couple of hours and lose all the, uh, uh, all the electricity generation that would happen above that, uh, uh, that line um, just to provide negative balancing energy. So this will be, will be very interesting to see which role wind and uh, by the way, solar will have in this, um, in this control reserve market in the future. Um, there are a lot of talks and there is a lot of discussion with TSOs, with uh, uh, scientists, etc as to how we can use the flexibility that even wind and solar have. Um, and I'm sure there will, be, um, uh, there will be good news basically over the next, let's say five years um, in, that, in that regard as well. Um, then I said already power trading, this is the core business that we have with wind and solar then. Um, so to have the most accurate forecasting as possible and then to trade that amount of electricity on the spot markets. Um, and thereby giving more lead time to other players in that market to react to the invariable uh, fluctuations that wind and solar have, which is very valuable. And we see that in Germany, um, that since virtual power plants and other what we call direct marketers or power traders that are specialized on renewable energies, 
have entered the German market, the, uh, the volume for short-term reserves, so basically the slide that I showed before, um, the volume of activated control reserve has gone down, which is interesting. Although in Germany, of course, the, the infeed um, uh, of, of wind and solar has risen sharply over the last 10, 15 years. And um, so the last couple of years, the last eight years to be precise, or nine years now, um, have, have broken the trend basically of what everybody out there often thinks that the more renewables, the more fluctuating renewables on the grid, uh, there will be more fluctuations or more short-term reserves that need to be balanced. There is some logic and truth to that, but there, is, there were some very easy ways for the first couple of, percent, for, let's say until we have 60%, 70% in the market, 60, 70% renewables in the market to counter that volatility <clears throat> just by a very short-term um, and very accurate um, forecasting and, and trading mechanism. Um, and then lastly, uh, I mentioned this before, uh, another product that we offer in, in, in the realm of, of, uh, of digitization is that we offer our technology to third parties to set up um, the same system for different business cases. May it be to have a more precise forecasting, to deliver control reserve, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I don't know, uh, timing wise, Stefan? <laughs> no, you can still speak. Okay. Uh, perhaps some, a little bit more details of, um, on how far we have progressed. We were founded in 2009. Um, today we are active in, um, as I said, a couple of Central European, Western European countries with our own virtual power plant, plus um, a couple of virtual power plants that we are now co-running <laughs> in other parts of the world. Um, and um, uh, we have more than 10,000 assets under management um, at the moment. Um, as you can see, the power delivery that we have directly to consumers is very low. So 100, uh, 140 giga gigawatt hours is not much. Um, most of the, by far, the, the largest part of what we aggregate and trade, we trade on wholesale markets. So there is not, this is sometimes a misconception of the virtual power plant that it's matchmaking one-on-one. -on -one. So if there is one power consumer, he or she will get the power from that source. Um, this would more be peer-to-peer -peer trading, um, which is something that we don't do. Um, so uh, we have the intermediary of a market. Um, why? First of all, because it's more liquid. Um, and the second reason is that um, you have uh, very good price signals coming from uh, short-term markets to balance out the whole system rather than balance out like let's say two individual parts of, of 2 million that are two, 92 million if you count every consumer or more than 100 million um, units basically that you have in Germany for example. So we use the market as an in the intermediary for clearing of course but also for, um, for a more systematic approach than to have this one and one one on one connection between um, a consumer and a producer. Yes, um, and uh, as you can see, uh, the, the amount of, um, uh, of uh, capacity that we have aggregated in our virtual power, power plant has risen ever since we, basically ever since we started. Um, the last couple of years were very steep, basically, uh, because of solar. We have seen a huge influx of, of photovoltaics into our virtual power plant. Wind, of course, as well, um, but uh, photovoltaics was, especially in Germany, um, a big technology that came on board in our virtual power plant. Yeah, I think that's it from my side, and I'm very open to any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you so much. And just, I remember, the, I think the growth is quite impressive. The last time I heard you, you were at three gigawatt or something that you were controlling, and now I... You mean in Pakistan, when we met in Pakistan the last time, uh, we should have had way more than three gigawatts back then already. So I would yeah. guess we were at eight or seven perhaps. <laughs> at that time, okay. Yeah, maybe I... I uh, the first time that you heard of us, yeah, we were pretty, mm, probably okay. very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, already you mentioned that we met indeed last time in person that was in Pakistan, yeah. the times when we could still travel. That's true. Uh, which was, of course, uh, different from today, time. but of course it's, <laughs> it's great that we can still meet in this way now. Yes. Um, do we have any any questions from anyone here? 
I think this this uh, sounds for me like really we have uh, really great presentations which somehow also fit to each other uh, because when I when I listen to all of you it's uh, that sounds quite exciting I think of the, the potential synergies between what you all are you have started some of you long ago like uh, now what we just heard um, and others just uh, with the uh, beginning and we're just at the, with the, at the beginning of this development. So as there is no direct question, if you still have any questions, please uh, write in the in the chat window here. I would say again, thank you, Jan, and greetings to Cologne, 30 thank kilometers you. from here. Yes. Um, not so far, still we have problems to meet, but anyway, thank you. And uh, now let's go to our uh, next speakers. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that uh, as well which is uh, Nick Martiniuk, who is co-founder and CEO of a rather new company as well, which is called wepower.com. And uh, what I think makes it already sound exciting that you deal with uh, blockchain technology. So you are based in the Baltic States, but you're doing already your business quite around the globe. And uh, we look forward now to hearing from you, Nick. seems to be a problem with sound. I think we can't hear you. No? Totally, there was some. Now there was something. Is it better? Please go ahead. Cool. Yeah, um, we started um, here in Baltics. Um, we are two co-founders from uh, from Baltic states. I'm based in Lithuania right now due to uh, Corona travel restrictions. Uh, my co-founder Casper, uh, he's uh, currently in Australia, uh, where most of our business is today. But uh, yeah, now we're also coming back to Europe. Um, I'll share my screen uh, to go over the. I hope you can see my screen right now. So yeah, it's uh, well, it's quite an exciting topic, which you know gets more exciting when you know the prices of uh, cryptocurrencies go up and people start talking about it again. But uh, essentially, it's it's a piece of technology. So it's a piece of technology. Uh, it doesn't solve um, everything, but uh, it has some some value. Uh, and when it's used properly, then basically you can you can have benefits out of it. So I'll, I'll just start with um, uh, with a brief presentation. I uh, introduce WePower and um, how we leverage blockchain technology uh, and simplify energy procurement today. So um, let's maybe then start with uh, the problems that we're trying to solve. So the energy system is uh, rapidly changing in global markets. Either wind or solar is already the cheapest source of electricity in the countries making around 73% of the world's GDP. This makes renewable energy a um, highly competitive uh, option for energy sourcing. Decentralization of energy uh, generation creates opportunities to buy green energy locally and cheap. At the same time, the average size of individual generation units is dropping. This creates um, options for smaller companies to buy green energy from multiple uh, sources of generation at the same time. Um, all these changes um, should make renewable energy a top choice among uh, energy consumers. However, adoption of green energy is severely limited by existing energy procurement process. And uh, the, the, the discussion mainly, you know, we, we had presentation today about how uh, uh, you know systems can be better and how markets can be better uh, by deploying technologies, but uh, in the end, it all comes uh, down to the customer and uh, what are limitations there to make the transactions go forward, and um, so that more renewable energy generation can be built. So the complexities of a traditional power purchase agreement or PPE process prevents most companies um, and consumers from accessing green energy directly. 
it's still a privilege uh, of the large corporates uh, to access that market. The remaining companies make up the majority of the corporate energy demand, uh, but at the same time cannot make the choice. The energy suppliers participation in green energy transition is also limited. They don't have the flexibility to provide customer, customers with a source transparent green energy products. Our idea is uh, quite simple from the beginning for um, green energy to scale, corporate energy procurement should be as easy as online shopping. And the benefits that uh, come with a large corporate PPA or just a PPA should be the same. We are addressing uh, the corporate uh, and industrial energy buyers first, as they make up two thirds of global energy consumption. And this is where we feel we can make the most impact. Our platform enables companies of all sizes to buy green energy directly from producers. And this way we unlock the floodgates of capital needed for renewable energy development. Uh, the best part uh, is that the demand is already there uh, from business of all sizes. We just have to give them the freedom to make the right choice. So what role does blockchain play in this solution? Using blockchain, we can establish full transparency in the energy markets, introduce new accountability systems needed to migrate to renewable energy, and establish new options for data exchange between market participants. There are three major benefits out of blockchain solutions uh, over decentralized solutions. Their benefits uh, are universally applicable to no matter if you use it in the energy or any other industry. First, it's an immutable ledger. This means that you can't reverse the data once uh, it's reported. It makes uh, recorded data tamper-proof, which is important uh, in, as a use case uh, for sensitive long-term energy uh, power purchase agreements. Second, blockchain ensures for transparency for the parties that have access to the data. It means that all the data that is, is sufficiently reliable um, to all parties and represented in that manner. Last, lastly, the data is decentralized. So uh, it's not a subject to a single point of failure. In our case, the core uh, usage is that it represents um, highly, competi uh, highly uh, competitive uh, way to securely store data for very long periods of time. Now we're not a blockchain first company. Um, we use the technology in our tech stack to provide uh, the procurement, the easiness of procurement to the final customers in the end. And the system itself is used by parties that would like to sell their energy to a larger customers, professional buyers, such as retailers that are using our system to interact with their, with their clients. Uh, going back to blockchain, we power proprietary technology uh, of tokenization is made up of two key elements. We have uh, smart energy contract and smart energy token. Smart contract is uh, an application existing on the blockchain network. Uh, in our case, smart energy contract stores uh, the PPA data and the renewable certificates data on the Ethereum blockchain. Using this contract, we can mint or release new smart energy tokens, meaning that smart energy tokens represent the share of the, meanwhile, the, the smart energy tokens represent the share of the energy production output and obligations that rise from that power purchase agreement. So let's have an example of how it works. Uh, let's take a seven year PPA sold via V Power Platform. In this case, it would be 84 uh, tokens uh, representing 84 monthly uh, trading and settlement intervals. Each token could be owned by unlimited number of owners, meaning that uh, it can be sold down and if you can imagine a tree, uh, so you would have validation of where the energy comes from at any point in time for the final customer starting from the source. Um, 
from the time intervals perspective, we can go more granular than that, but it always comes to what the business requirement is. Um, data itself can be validated up to uh, watts uh, and on the time scale, which is uh, acceptable. So some countries have uh, one hour settlement period, some, some have already half an hour. Uh, Australia, where uh, we're working, they're going to, uh, to much shorter intervals, so up to five minutes. So why are we leveraging uh, and what are the key benefits of blockchain? So first of all, it's trust. Trust between the parties that can be uh, established uh, efficiently, enabling easy uh, trading of PPAs and uh, certificates. Once it, it's available or if it's available, the parties would like to do that. Uh, auditability, um, it was always clear when, how much energy was produced, how, that, uh, how the production relates to the certificate that the, uh, the party would receive. And we typically work with uh, the existing certification systems in place in the country um, because they're already there and they're quite efficient. But what is important to customers is how to actually understand in the time of their consumption, what was their coverage of uh, renewable energy. Um, high availability. With blockchain, there's no single point of failure and the contracts that uh, carry important information can be stored uh, quite cheaply on the blockchain in comparison to, for example, uh, the same solution on AWS. Last but not least, automation. With blockchain, many of the current energy market processes could be fully or partially automated uh, down to buy yourself what you wish type of solution. As a showcase of the technology, um, yes, some time ago we partnered with uh, Elring, Estonia, an Estonian uh, transmission systems operator to prove Ethereum blockchain technology's scalability for renewable energy transactions. We managed to tokenize uh, 24 terawatts of energy data. There was one year uh, data for all the uh, consumption points and production points in uh, Estonia. Uh, and it worked nicely. Uh, naturally, there's no, uh, there's no business case of putting all of the data right now on the Ethereum blockchain. It probably would not make sense. But uh, when we're talking about uh, valuable contracts, valuable transaction, it it has some benefit and it has uh, quite a lot of sense to that. Um, yeah, we're, um, we apply different uh, information scalability solutions based on client sizes when dealing with small, large uh, number of uh, smaller corporate industrial customers. And when it's best to aggregate the informa information under a larger party, such as a, a retailer uh, participating in these transactions. On the other hand, for large and medium uh, corporate industrial customers, data is individually tracked on blockchain, which provides them that direct layer of information, how their contract performs, uh, what is the, uh, what type of energy comes uh, as a balancing energy uh, towards that contract, and how they are sustainable at each point in time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, very interesting, uh, kind of giving us some insights of um, what you're doing. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? And let me ask you uh, the first, uh, since how long have you now been doing this in practice? Uh, our company is uh, three and a half years old right now. Okay. Then how, how far are you depending on, on the regulations? Would you say you can do this in many uh, countries around the world or, or how far are you limited? Which kind of market structure do you know? We are not that limited to markets. I would say the main limitation comes from uh, whether there's uh, data information on the market itself. Uh, if the market operates, if we take uh, countries like any European country, yes, we can work in any country. US, yes, uh, the TAM, yes. Um, China, no. Uh, so 
until the market is regularized uh, to a point where uh, there's a the market you can um, do a PPA and peg your price towards the uh, some specific market price, um, then then we'll be able to also work there. Well, we just heard also in the first presentation that there's also a, a kind of liberalization process on the way. Maybe that's also a good way how to start getting connected. Um, so you'd say that in, in many, I mean, there's a big, uh, in, in principle, a big market, uh, potential market for your, your technology now already um, there. Which you yeah, we're currently focused uh, mostly on Australia, uh, but at the same time now we, this, uh, in the end of last year, we started working in Europe with uh, some of the partners here. So um, yeah, continuing work. Um, it's, it's quite exciting. It's a uh, very interesting market, very interesting changes in the market itself happened uh, over the past uh, year with the corona. So um, yeah, we see that the market actually, from our perspective at least, it's uh, shifting uh, dramatically towards more renewable. So it's, uh, it's great. Well, I mean, that's what we also observe in uh, Australia, which has a obviously very much liberalized market. The renewables are kind of really flourishing there. Um, while in some of the European countries, I mean, my home country, Germany, it's not so going so well. So it's uh, obviously a good a starting point uh, indeed. Yeah, but then uh, again, thank you very much from my side. Um, and that almost brings me back to Australia where we started with Peter Ray. But let me first say, I think we had really four excellent presentations and it's really worthwhile to listen to all of you again. Uh, let me mention that this this webinar is not only now broadcasted on social media on our YouTube channel, but it will also be later made available there. So just the uncut version is already there, but we will uh, kind of put those four presentations, separate uh, uh, presentations, and then make it available uh, so that people who want to know about how blockchain or original power plants are used today, they can listen to you again. Yeah, thanks so much. And I think uh, um, uh, we, we had a very important uh, discussion at this point of time. I'm sure we will talk more about this uh, in the future. Thanks to all the speakers, to all of you. And again, thank you very much to our partners also for this webinar, uh, Profec Ventus. Let me also mention that, uh, you know, we're offering these webinars uh, free of charge. We're always happy to have companies who want to join us as members, because that is, of course, the basis for the work that we're doing. We're also happy, of course, we're offering also sponsorship opportunities for these webinars. And with that, let me hand over for some final words. Uh, if Peter, you are still with us, uh, just to say a goodbye to our audience. Peter. If you unmute yourself again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, just, yes, please. Thank you. That was a very exciting trip we've just taken and it stimulates a lot of thought and a lot of discussion, I imagine, which will follow this. There were some things that I understood and some parts of it I'm afraid I will have to do some more work uh, to understand, but the stimulation that uh, it gives is something that's very worthwhile. And I think all of those who joined in will have enjoyed and learned something from it. Those who didn't join in, I think have missed out on some information and uh, some thing which has been a very interesting evening. So thank you. I add to what Stefan has said, thank you very much to all of those who are the speakers and thank you also to those who were interested enough to uh, listen and uh, to participate. It's one of the things that I think we ought to revisit sometime in the not too distant future to just uh, see how far things uh, change, how rapidly they change. There are interesting approaches to what I see as uh, some challenges which uh, the world faces as we become more sophisticated and some of the sophistication and some of the suggestions tonight that we've heard uh, today um, really uh, excites uh, some further talk, some further opportunity. Uh, thank you. I won't go through any of the individuals, but thank you uh, one and all for what has been a very worthwhile 
webinar. Thank you. Then have a nice day, have a nice evening, have a good day, have a, a good night wherever you are. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.